lectures ago, I told you that the molecule ATP serves as a common energy currency in cells. Specifically, I told you how ATP provides the energy needed to drive endergonic, those are the energy requiring reactions, uphill from an energy point of view. That is, ATP powers anabolic reactions, another name we've used, that are building complex biomolecules. Starting in today's lecture and continuing over the next several lectures, we're going to look at how ATP is produced by the cell. We'll begin today with an overview of the energy needs of the cell and a look of, at where this energy comes from and how it's stored in ATP and in a couple of other important en energy carrier molecules. This discussion will also lead us to consider a little more chemistry that we have to understand, specifically how a kind of reaction called an oxidation-reduction reaction works. Then in the following lectures, we'll look in more detail at how ATP is manufactured using energy that's stored in sugar molecules, and finally, how energy from the sun is used by plants and other photosynthetic organisms to make those sugars in the first place. Let's begin today with a brief review to set up the questions we'll need to turn to next. We've seen how ATP often provides the energy to drive endergonic reactions in a two-step process. First, ATP donates a phosphate group to one of the substrates of the reaction, in this way raising the free energy of that substrate. Then that phosphorylated substrate can complete the reaction because it has extra energy to give up. Um, as the reaction proceeds, essentially powering an otherwise endergonic reaction uphill energetically. We've also seen how the biochemical reactions in a cell are catalyzed by enzymes. Now last time I pointed out that enzymes lower the activation energy needed to get reactions to run, which is necessary even for exergonic reactions that release energy overall. But here's the question. Lowering the activation energy of a, react of a reaction would seem to be irrelevant when we're talking about endergonic reactions because these reactions run entirely uphill. The concept of an enzyme lowering an activation energy barrier doesn't make, make as much sense for how enzymes are involved in these endergonic reactions because they're not going to actually change the overall energy react uh, relationships of that reaction, as I said. Now, in fact, most of the enzymes that we've looked at earlier in the course, for example, all the enzymes that are involved in DNA synthesis or protein synthesis and so forth, all of these are catalyzing anabolic reactions, not catabolic reactions. So how is it that enzymes play a role in endergonic reactions? Well, the answer to this question is largely that these enzymes are helping to couple the energy donated by ATP to the substrate of the reaction. Or to put it in simpler terms, the role of an enzyme is to help get the phosphate group transferred from the ATP to the compound that's got to be transformed. Now this role does involve lowering activation energy, in a sense, because it lowers the reactivation energy of the reaction that will cleave a phosphate off of ATP, and that's necessary to get that phosphate transferred. But the functional outcome of this event is to couple the energy, couple the energy stored in ATP with the reaction that's being powered. Thus, we call these kinds of enzymes in general coupling enzymes. That is, a coupling enzyme is an enzyme that couples the exergonic reaction that hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and an inorganic phosphate group. It couples that with an endergonic reaction, such as a reaction that converts some low energy substrate to a high energy product. Now, I need to step back at this point and tell you a little bit more about what ATP does because actually ATP is used by cells in many more ways than just in assisting with the anabolic synthesis of complex organic compounds. ATP powers most of what the cell does. In fact, anything that involves work usually requires energy and this energy usually comes in the form of ATP. Now, when ATP is powering an anabolic reaction uphill by phosphorylating one of the substrates, we would say that ATP, in this sense, is doing chemical work. The kind of work ATP does in the context of muscle movement that we've looked at, however, is a little different. Here, ATP provides a phosphate group that phosphorylates the protein myosin, you'll recall. But the point here is not to drive a metabolic reaction. The myosin doesn't change into something else, but instead simply to change the shape of the molecule. 
Remember, changes in the shape of the myosin molecule, basically moving the head portion of the molecule back and forth, is essential for myosin and actin to interact in the way that a muscle, will cause it, uh, a muscle cell will contract under tension. Now, in this case, what ATP is doing is a kind of mechanical work by changing the shape of this molecule. Similarly, ATP is used by many other kinds of what we call motor proteins, proteins that change their shape and in so doing are involved in moving materials uh, from one place to another in a cell. ATP also provides the energy needed to power active ion channels. Remember, those are the transmembrane proteins that will pump materials like ions or other compounds uphill against their concentration gradient. That also requires ATP. That also requires energy. That energy usually comes in the form of ATP. And in this case, we would say that ATP is performing a kind of transport work. Now, the take-home message here is that ATP is used to provide energy for cellular processes of all sort. And as a result, you could imagine that the use of ATP by an organism is prodigious. By one estimate, for example, a typical single muscle cell, just one muscle cell, when it's contracting, is thought to consume about 10 million molecules of ATP per second. 10 million molecules of ATP per second for one typical vertebrate muscle cell. This shouldn't be surprising because there are, there are hundreds of thousands of myosin heads in a single muscle cell all moving back and forth, and each time that myosin head extends to its high energy configuration, it uses up one ATP. There's another even more striking estimate I like, which is that an average vertebrate animal will consume its body weight in ATP every day. To put that in context, that means that an average six-foot-tall adult human male, such as myself, might, might use up the equivalent of 180 pounds or more of ATP each day. That is a lot of ATP. Now, of course, it's difficult to know how accurate estimates like this really are, given the number of factors that have to be considered. But even if these kinds of estimates are only vaguely accurate, they still illustrate how much ATP is used by an individual organism to power itself, how it's used by the cells of that, how much is used by the cells of that organism. This leads us to a key question. Where does all of this ATP come from? When ATP donates a phosphate group, Remember, we're left with a molecule of ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Still got two phosphates attached. Fortunately, ADP can be recharged by adding a phosphate group back, producing another molecule of ATP. But this process isn't energetically free either. Recharging ADP to become ATP requires some energy. It takes energy to build back the bond that's going to put that phosphate group back on. So really, the question we need to ask is, where does the energy needed to make more ATP come from? Where do we get this energy? Well, we know now that catabolic reactions release energy and that cells can run catabolic reactions. So we might expect that catabolic reactions could provide the cell with the energy needed to make more ATP from ADP. Specifically, we might hypothesize that just as there are coupling enzymes that couple the energy released by the hydrolysis of ATP with endergonic reactions to drive those reactions energetically uphill, there might also be different kinds of coupling enzymes that do the reverse. Enzymes that couple the release of energy from exergonic reactions to drive the production of ATP from ADP. Again, basically running an endergonic reaction going from ADP to ATP uphill by taking the energy that's been coupled from some other, some other exergonic reaction. In fact, this is what does happen. The source of energy used to make more ATP does come from energy-releasing energy catabolic reactions associated with the breakdown of energy-rich bi uh, complex biomolecules. However, not all catabolic reactions that run in a cell run in a way that allow the cell to harvest the energy that's released or to store it in the form of ATP. Instead, most of the, most of the catabolic reactions that run in a cell simply give up the energy that they release as heat. This heat is dissipated. It's lost to the cell. It's of no use. Only a small number of very specialized reactions have evolved to capture the energy released by cat. Uh, only a small number of specialized reactions have evolved to capture the energy that's released 
with the breakdown of high energy organic molecules with some degree of efficiency in a way, and in a way that allows that energy that's released to be captured and used to make more ATP. These reactions are associated with the metabolic processes that we refer to as glycolysis and cellular respiration. The reactions of glycolysis and cellular respira respiration are shared in common um, by almost all organisms. In fact, this commonality suggests that the fundamental mechanisms by which organisms extract and process energy must have evolved very early in the history of life on Earth. Just as those fundamental mechanisms we looked at for storing information in DNA and, and bringing that information out into proteins are shared in common among almost all organisms, suggesting that they're evolutionarily ancient, these, en these reactions involved with bioenergetics in the cell are equally old, almost equally old suggesting they evolved very early on. And this isn't surprising at all, given how important energy is for life to exist. Well, let's look at this in general. The combined action of glycolysis and cellular respiration is the biological equivalent of burning organic compounds. Now, imagine I have a piece of paper and I light it on fire. The paper is made out of organic compounds. Actually, it's made out of cellulose, which is a form of carbohydrate, which is, which is a kind of sugar. Now, if I light this piece of paper on fire, of course, it burns up. What do I get out of it? I know I get heat. What I don't see so clearly, but what I also get out of this is some water and some carbon dioxide. Now, let me give you a verbal equation that describes this burning of the piece of paper. You can write this down if you want to keep track of it. I'm going to tell you this verbally, and then later on I'm going to give you a chemical uh, equation version of this. If we were going to write a verbal equation of burning a piece of paper, we might write organic compound, the cellulose, organic compound, plus oxygen, we need oxygen in there, yields carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. The energy we get out is the heat from the fire, of course. Now, any kind of organic compound, including carbohydrates that make up a piece of paper, but also fats and proteins, even nucleic acids, all can be burned. And they can all be burned as fuel by cells. But the most common fuel used by cells, the most common chemical compound used to, as a fuel by a cell to create energy to be captured for ATP is the relatively simple sugar, glucose. So let me tell you a little bit about the structure of glucose as some background. Like all sugars, glucose is basically a chain of carbon atoms bonded to each other. And each carbon atom in a molecule of glucose is bonded also to a hydrogen atom and to what we call a hydroxyl group. A hydroxyl group is just an oxygen and a hydrogen uh, themselves bonded together. Now, glucose is a six-carbon sugar. Um, what that means is that there are six carbons involved in that sugar chain, and usually glucose occurs in a ring-like form. So those carbons sort of uh, um, connect back to each other, forming a ring. We've seen a sugar molecule in a ring form earlier, I should point out, when we looked at the pentose sugars that are uh, part of the backbone of nucleic acid. These were pentose sugars because they have five carbons. Glucose is a six-carbon sugar. Now, the exact details of the molecular structure of glucose don't really matter to us. But if we count the numbers of different types of atoms that make up a glucose molecule, we'd end up with the following. We'd end up with six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. So if we were going to write the chemical formula of glucose, we would write C6H12O6. And you remember from high school chemistry, the, the little numbers are subscripts. So you would write a, a big C and a little 6, and then a, a big H for hydrogen and a little 12, and then a big O and, and a little 6. C6H12O6. It means six carbons of uh, molecules of car uh, uh, atoms of carbon, uh, 12 atoms of hydrogen, six atoms of oxygen. Now, the reason I point this out is given that we know glucose is the major fuel used for the production of energy by the cell, it means we can rewrite that general verbal equation a little bit more specifically um, relative to what a cell has to accomplish. And if we were to write down the chemical equation for burning glucose, what we would write down is C6H12O6, that's the glucose, plus 6 O2s, those are the oxygens, and we need six of them, 
The exact numbers you don't have to keep track of now, but that turns out to be what we need. And if we have the glucose and the oxygen react, then that reaction would yield for us six molecules of carbon dioxide, CO2, six uh, molecules of, of water, H2O, and a bunch of energy. So this equation is the basic chemical equation for burning glucose. What we want to understand then is how cells make this chemical reaction run. That is how the cell burns glucose. What we'll see is that cells don't run this reaction in a single step. Far from it. Instead, cells accomplish this end. They get from one side of this equation to the other only through a long series of intermediate reactions that allow the process to be controlled and allow the energy to be released gradually so it can be captured and used to produce ATP. Well, in order to understand how this works, we have to begin with a little more background um, to answer the question, where is the energy in glucose? I've been talking about glucose as being a high energy molecule. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about how to think about energy in a molecule like glucose. In other words, what we want to ask is, why does the breakdown of glucose, or any other organic compound for that matter, yield energy? When we burn glucose, where does the heat come from? Well, the answer to this question has to do with the nature of the chemical bonds that carbon atoms form and the energy in the electrons involved in those bonds. Here's how it works. In many chemical reactions, there's a transfer of one or more electrons from one of the reactants to the other. Remember, our basic molecule of an atom is that an atom might be made of some protons and some neutrons and some electrons. Now, this is not a course in physics, so we don't need to get into details here, but we know that these atoms have electrons, and often when a chemical reaction is occurring, what happens as part of this is electrons will be transferred from one of the reactants to another one of the reactants. These transfers of electrons are called oxidation reduction reactions or we call them redox reactions for short. Now, in a redox reaction, the loss of electrons from an atom or a compound is called oxidation, while the addition of electrons to a compound is called reduction. Now, these are some names that we'll want to keep track of, and I have to admit that when I first learned these, it was a little confusing. These names are historical in origin, so let me tell you where the history comes from. As we'll see in a minute, the element uh, um, oxygen is a very strong attractor of electrons. We say that a substance has been oxidized when it loses electrons because in many reactions, those electrons end up going to an oxygen, so it's been oxidized. So the loss of electrons we refer to as oxidation. Now, the name reduction refers to the case when a compound gains electrons. Now, this is even more counterintuitive. I mean, we're talking about a compound gaining electrons, but we call it reduction. Why so? Well, this comes from an earlier time when chemists thought more in terms of positive charges than negative charges. We now know that electrons move between compounds and we're interested in the movement of electrons, but earlier on, chemists were looking at how positive compounds were. So when you add electrons to a compound, you reduce its positive charge. Just try to keep in mind, oxidation, you lose electrons. Reduction, you gain electrons. Now, we still haven't answered the question of where the energy comes from. I mean, we've just moved electrons from one thing to another. I mean, there's still electrons there. Why is there a difference in net energy in the system? Well, the reason for this is that some kinds of atoms, some elements, hold their electrons more closely into, them than, uh, into themselves than others. Elements that hold electrons more tightly are said, to, are said to be more electronegative. Now again, I don't want to get into the details of the physical chemistry here, but what this has to do with the fact that atoms, the electrons in atoms occur in orbital shells. In other words, electrons can occur in different um, uh, uh, energy levels relative to the atom. There are some elements that hold their electrons close in, in orbitals that are very low energy states, where there are other kinds of elements, atoms, that allow their electrons to be out further in higher energy level states. Now, we can keep track of this by contrasting the two most important atoms we're interested in, which are carbon and oxygen. O uh, carbon is not very electronegative. 
This means it has a weaker pull on its electrons, which means that these electrons tend to occur in a high energy state. So the electrons associated with carbon hold a lot of energy because they're in a high energy state. By contrast, oxygen is highly, is highly electronegative. This means that oxygen has a very strong pull on its electrons, which means that it holds those electrons in tight at low energy levels. So the electrons in carbon are at higher energy levels than the electrons associated with oxygen. What that means is that if an electron that's associated with a carbon atom moves to an elect uh, if an electron associated with a carbon atom moves over to an oxygen atom, there is energy lost because the energy that the electron held in the carbon atom, because it was allowed to hold that energy, is now lost because the oxygen doesn't allow the electron to hold that energy. Okay, the important bottom line here, the thing you really have to keep in mind is that the bonds in a carbon-rich organic molecule such as glucose are full of energy because the carbon atoms allow their electrons to have this energy. But if these electrons are transferred from carbon atoms to oxygen atoms, then this energy is released. This is where we get energy from a redox reaction. Now there's one more thing to know to keep track of this, and that is that although redox reactions often do actually physically transfer electrons from one compound to another, they don't necessarily do so. In other words, it could just be that the um, electrons in a compound move to be closer to one atom in that compound than to the other. For example, carbon dioxide, CO2, is one of the products of combustion. And here there is a carbon but there's also two oxygens bound to that carbon. And here what has happened is that the electrons have stayed with the carbon in part, but they're more closely attracted to the oxygen. So the electrons associated with carbon in carbon dioxide are relatively low energy, whereas the electrons associated with carbon that might be just bound to, bonded to other carbon atoms are allowed to be higher energy. It's a redox reaction nonetheless, it's just that the electrons haven't physically moved. Okay, so really all of this background about redox reactions is just to set up another way to state the question we're really interested in, which is to ask, how do cells oxidize glucose? How do cells reduce the energy levels of the carbons in glucose, which are at a very high energy state, to a lower energy state, which would be the carbons associated with carbon dioxide, one of the products of burning glucose? Now, before we get to the details about how cells do that, there's another major problem that we have to address, or really that cells have to address when they oxidize glucose. Remember I told you that oxidation, which is where we're going to get all of this energy from, is like burning organic compounds. And in fact, burning is a kind of oxidation, make no mistake about it. But when you light something on fire and you're oxidizing it, what happens is that actually the oxidation occurs very explosively. It occurs very suddenly, in an uncontrolled fashion. And all of the energy released from the oxidation of that carbon in the piece of paper, for example, we're setting on fire, is lost. It's just dissipated in the form of heat. What cells have to do is to control that burning. And the way they do that, as I told you before, is by using a series of reactions that release the energy obtained from oxidizing glucose just a little bit at a time. And they do that in a way that allows them to capture that energy in a controlled fashion. Now, equally important to having a more gradual, stepwise approach to oxidizing a compound, it's important also to keep oxygen out of this as much as possible. Remember, oxygen is a real electron hog. Oxygen wants to pull electrons into it very strongly. And so if oxygen gets into the system, then the system might just combust spontaneously. Cells have solved the problem of keeping oxygen out of the process until the very end when oxygen is necessary to eventually accept electrons through the evolution of a couple kinds of special molecules or a few kinds of special molecules that we call electron carriers. Now we don't need to go into the biochemical details of electron carriers, but I just want to point out and name a couple of them that will be important to us. The most important of these is a compound called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, big name. We'll call it NAD for short. Now the point is this, NAD exists in two stable forms. It exists in an oxidized form, 
That's a form that doesn't, that's missing a few electrons, it's oxidized, and we call this NAD+. The plus here just indicates that it's positively charged, as you would expect because it's oxidized. Now, this molecule can also pick up a couple of electrons, and when it does so, it also picks up an extra hydrogen, and we call it then NADH. NADH is the reduced form, the form with added electrons, of this particular molecule. NAD is kind of interesting because chemically it's related to ATP and ADP. In fact, it includes an adenine base and a pentose sugar, just like ATP, and then it has a couple of phosphate groups, again, just like ATP and ADP. But instead of a terminal phosphate group, it actually adds at the end another um, uh, uh, pentose sugar and another organic base. And it's this additional organic base at the end that is going to either pick up or release electrons. Now, how does NAD actually capture electrons uh, from some other molecule? It does this with the help of a kind of enzyme, a kind of enzyme that we call a dehydrogenase. Uh, it's called a dehydrogenase because it removes hydrogen and the electrons associated with, with it from some other molecule, so it dehydrogenizes it. So we call these dehydrogenases in general. What a dehydrogenase does is remove a couple of electrons and, and an associated um, proton, that's just a, a, a hydrogen ion, from some substrate, but transfer those electrons directly to the NAD, directly to NAD+, reducing it to become NADH. There's actually another related compound we'll run into called flavin, uh, flavin adenine dinucleotide, or FAD for short. And again, it does something similar. It has two stable states, an oxidized state and a reduced state. I'll just mention that now because we're going to run across that particular molecule a little bit later on. For present purposes, we can just simply think of NAD and FAD as being two kinds of electron carrier molecules, or what are sometimes called electron shuttle molecules. Now, the most important thing to understand about NAD and FAD is that electrons lose very little of their energy when they're transferred to these electron shuttle molecules. This is because these compounds are more electronegative than the substrates that they extract electrons from. In other words, they draw electrons to them a little bit more, but only a little bit more. So the electrons are drawn to these electron shuttles and stay with these electron shuttles, but they don't go to a very low energy state. Contrast this with oxygen. If electrons get picked up by oxygen and are shuttled into oxygen, they lose a lot of energy. If they get picked up by one of these electron uh, transport molecules, one of these electron carriers, then they only lose a little bit of energy. And what this means is that the electrons that are now associated with these electron shuttle molecules, NADH or FADH2 is the reduced form of that uh, molecule, those electrons still have energy that could be used by the cell to do something else. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of energy in those electrons. It also turns out that the energy in those electrons, in these electron shuttle molecules, actually isn't in a very usable form. Let's contrast this with ATP. Remember, ATP stores energy in the bonds between phosphate groups, and as we've seen, that bond between, the bond between phosphate groups is something that is relatively unstable, and the transfer of the phosphate is a very convenient way to transfer energy to another compound. The electrons that are stored in um, the reduced forms of these electron shuttles are not so easily given to just any other process. They're not so easily donated to make their energy available to run something else. Instead, as we'll see later, the primary role of these electron carrier molecules is to shuttle the high energy electrons they've captured from some other organic molecule to yet a different process, some other process that will itself use that energy specifically to make ATP. ATP is still our basic currency. We just use these electron shuttle molecules to help get a whole bunch of energy to a process that can generate a whole bunch of ATP. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about chemistry up to this point. This background is important to understand how living systems are able to capture and process energy in organic compounds. In a very real sense, the ability of cells to do this is just as important a property of life as the ability of DNA to store and transmit information.
What we're going to do next time is to begin to look at the catabolic reactions that a cell uses to break down glucose and how the energy is obtained gradually in a way that will be able to be used to produce ATP for the cell.